Hi folks, welcome back to the channel, Mantle Productions here. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the HMS Surprise. Uh, I know it's been a while since I released a naval action video, and I did say uh, in previous videos that I would be producing videos of naval action. Uh, the reason I haven't yet is because, well, I've been a bit busy recently with, with other things going on with, uh, with life, and so I did want to take a little bit of time to have a think about exactly what kind of naval actual naval action videos I wanted to produce. Um, I didn't just want to produce the general gameplay, I wanted to produce something that uh, is a little different, um, that comes at the game with a different slant of uh, understanding and learning a little bit more about the different ships that, uh, that are used in the game. Um, and of course with a bit of tactical gameplay and stuff. Um, so today we're going to look at the HMS Surprise. Uh, the Surprise is not um, it's it's a complicated ship, I suppose you could say, from the from the viewpoint of history. Um, there have been a few actually actually there have been a few HMS surprises during history, um, but I'll just go down a list of information I have here about the ship. This is from the Naval Action Forums. Um, so this is a ship that originally was designed and built by the French in 1794 and it was called Leonite and it was actually captured by the HMS Inconstant in 1796 lovely lovely name for a ship I don't know why the English would call a ship of theirs HMS Inconstant but there we go um, and it was brought into the, no the Royal Navy as HMS Surprise it was a 28 gun 6 rate and so let's just have a look at the stats of the original Leonite. Under French service, it had 24 8 pounder long guns and 8 4 pounder long guns on the quarter deck and fore uh, forecastle. It's forecastle or forecastle, it's actually the way you pronounce it. Um, and that's actually, to begin with, a very interesting loadout. Um, much lower than, than any loadout that I've ever heard of for the surprise, or most people would think the surprise would be would have as a loadout, um, but we'll get to that later. Um, and so when that when it was captured by the English, it was then uh, regunned, and the armament in English service was 24 9-pounder long guns, 8 4-pounder long guns on the quarterdeck, 4 12-pounder carronades on the quarterdeck, 2 12-pounder carronades on the, on the, the forecastle, and uh, probably bow chasers uh, as well. They had uh, two four pounder long guns as bow chasers. Uh, even these light guns were found to be too heavy and unwieldy for the ship's narrow hull and were placed, replaced with carronades. Um, so the English, of course, capturing a beautiful ship like this, beefed up her armament a bit. Um, Interesting note about general uh, national uh, construction standards. The French uh, usually constructed better quality ships than the English did. Uh, despite this fact, the English basically ruled the waves uh, for, for a long, long time. Um, but if you think about the, the nations uh, at play here, the, the English at that time, due to being an island nation, let's say, the quality of, of lumber or timber that they would have used, uh, especially in wartime, you know, they're knocking together these ships that w with, you know, 60, 70, 80 year old oak trees, seasoned oak trees. And then, the, you know, these ships are going together and then going out to the high seas and being shot at and possibly sinking within five to 10 years. So if you think about it, you've got a tree that takes 80, you know, 50 to 80 years, let's say, to mature into good oak. Um, and oak was, was generally the one thing they would have wanted to use in ship construction because it's a hardwood and it's very good. Um, you, you have an 80-year-old 80, 80 oak tree which is being destroyed by, you know, the elements and the French, you know, within, you know, five to ten years and needs to be replaced. But yet those trees that they're sourcing are, you know, 50 to 80 years old. So very quickly the quality of English timber uh, would would go down in wartime, um, uh, but of course the French, on the other hand, having a, a very m much larger land mass, uh, would have had a much better sourcing of, of timber to build ships, and they just built ships, I think, with better better quality, uh, faster, drier. They they weren't as susceptible to 
uh, you know, leaks and dampness and mold and all that kind of thing. Uh, and that that's just a, a snippet of information I've got from the Patrick O'Brien novels. So, you know, take a, take that for what it is. Um, but uh, the Patrick O'Brien novels are very, very uh, accurate uh, anyway. So um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's terribly unrealistic to say that. Um, and so uh, that was in the English service. The, the they beefed up the armament uh, later. Um, they had a carronade only armament, uh, and the English uh, again later on uh, revamped the armament and put in 24 32 pounder carronades, 10 18 pounder carronades on the quarter deck and forecastle, and two four pounder long guns as bow chasers, of course. Okay, so let's now move on to the HMS Surprise as known in the Jack Aubrey series of, of books and the film that came out with Russell Crowe in it, which, to be honest, is still one of my favorite films. Um, O'Brien describes her as a 28-gun 6-rate, or a jackass frigate, which is just the slang for it, formerly the French corvette Leonite in 1794, and as you can see, they, the French deem her as a corvette um, at that time period, which we'll, we'll come into later. Um, this background is entirely historical. But uh, O'Brien's surprise carries 12 pounders instead of the historical French 8 pound and English 9 pound long guns. So in the books, um, Patrick O'Brien would have beefed up the, the armament to 12 pounders e e unhistorically. So that, that was his, per, you know, uh, his literary license to, to beef that up. Um, she also retains the 36 gun sh ship mainmast, which was briefly installed in the historical frigate by an English dockyard. The experiment was unsuccessful, and the surprise ended up at least one mast sized, uh, one mast sized for an even smaller 24 gun ship. So she basically had one mast that was too big. Uh, that's what that's saying. And I'm getting all this information from the uh, uh, from a collection of stuff from the the forums. So I'll, I'll put a link to the description uh, so you can uh, read at your own leisure later. Um, and that pretty much is is what's going on with, with the HMS Surprise. Let me just have a look if there's any more information I need to touch on. Nope, nope, that's, that's pretty much all I need to talk about at this point. Let's just move over now to uh, some, some gameplay and uh, let's see uh, how, she, how she handles in naval action. Okay, folks, uh, welcome back. Uh, here we are in uh, a matchup between two surprises and two constitutions. Uh, this was a very interesting game. I really enjoyed this game, in fact, because uh, it was obviously a very even matchup. This is in multiplayer. Um, and there was very good communication between myself and my friendly constitution. As you can see in the bottom left hand corner in the chat box uh, for the last seven and a half minutes, we were kind of planning our moves, and uh, he was just. Uh, Every now and then you'll see him post about uh, what heading we should both be heading at at the same time. So we're, we're playing it very tight here, and I think we needed to because having a very, very even matchup like this really brings out your tactical skills as opposed to just uh, straight numbers. Um, so you can see me here uh, jostling for position on the enemy surprise here as he cuts in behind my... my, uh, my backside there and you can see he kind of destroys my my stern which isn't a terribly big problem because I can fix that when I uh, use a repair kit and um, to be honest I was I was more I was more scared of losing my side armor than I was my 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 uh, front or back armor um, I probably should be much more concerned about my my stern and my my front but here you see uh, a few minutes ago I changed back to ball shot because we went out of range of the constitution um, and I'm one I'm someone where double shot is great if you're in range but the second you get out of range you really need to be anticipating when you're going to get out of range so that you can immediately change back to ball shot to keep the shots flowing because if you're on if you're shooting double shot and you don't time it right you can uh, you can waste time and waste perfectly good opportunities to get shots in if you haven't yet changed back to ball so um, yeah so for the last seven and a half minutes we've been kind of 
maneuvering against the enemy. Uh, you can see that we've been sticking quite closely together, and I think that really worked to, very well. Uh, the guy, the guy you can see there, just on the left-hand side in the Constitution, um, he just worked very well. Um, very good communication between us both. We both knew where each other were and what was going on and what we wanted to do pretty much all the time. Um, and you can see uh, to the, the enemies have split up. Uh, the Constitution over there, uh, plane rider. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, a, a few minutes ago, he got out of our range and he kind of stays out of our range. I think he accidentally goes a bit too far downwind and spends valuable time trying to beat back up into the wind to uh, to re-engage us. But uh, during that time, that gives us time to isolate the surprise and really chew the surprise up. Um, for a long, long time, the surprise stays afloat much longer than I thought it would, really. Uh, but I suppose that's just clever use of your repair kits um, <clears throat> and your survival mode. Um, but yeah, I think the problem I think the problem with the enemy here was that they didn't stick together and they sep they got separated and that enabled us to focus both of our fire on one ship, which which really is not a good thing uh, to have happen to you. We both knew from the very beginning that we wanted to take out the surprise first. Um, there is a kind of balance uh, already appearing in this game where you've got bigger bigger ships like the Constitution, more guns, more armor, harder, tougher nuts to crack. But then you've got the smaller ships, which, like the Surprise, they've got less guns, less armor, but they're more maneuverable. And so your tactics at the beginning, you're always thinking, uh, should I go out, out uh, should I go and knock out the very large ships first, or should I knock out the smaller, more maneuverable ships first, uh, and then that will give me uh, time and space to go and then hunt down the larger ships without being harassed by smaller ships because during the time that you're hunting down the large ships if you've got a load of surprises or smaller ships whatever ship type you're in if you've got a lot of smaller ships that are still alive they're all going to be going after you because they're trying to defend their larger ships so if you can knock out the the people that will get in your way then that means that you have uh, superior numbers when you actually go to knock out the capital ships. So, uh, and in this particular instance, um, you can see that we've left the, the Constitution well alone at this point. We're not paying any attention to the Constitution. Yes, every now and then we get up, uh, some shots that come across and, and hit us from the Constitution. But that really, at the moment, isn't a big deal. Our, our big main goal at this point is to knock out the surprise. And as you can see, that we're doing that uh, fairly well. Um, and you can see the surprise really has no armor left, but it's still afloat. And I think he remains afloat for a while longer. He does a very good job at uh, managing his, his uh, damage. <coughs> And uh, at this point, I kind of break away from my friendly constitution just because I I'm that earnest to sink the surprise as quickly as possible. Uh, the quicker we sink that enemy surprise, the quicker and that we can get back to the enemy constitution, who has now... Um, actually, he still hasn't regained the, the weather gauge. As you can see, we're really... Actually, no... No, I'm sorry, I lie. He has the weather gauge now, and he's now coming down at uh, full speed towards us. Um, as you see, I'm directly sailing directly downwind now, and he's behind us, d uh, d behind us in the wind. And so there, uh, we really want to push the surprise, the enemy surprise, as much as we can at the moment. Sink that thing as quickly as possible. And you can see, uh, in the last few minutes. We've been nailing the enemy surprise's armor, but you, you can see the armor is, is replenishing, which means he's using his repair kits. And it's just a question of how many repair kits he has left versus how long we can still hammering the surprise and before the, the enemy constitution gets back and then we have a, a 2v2 conflict. Um, as you can see here now, this is a difficult situation where uh, the, the the friendly constitution is in between me and my target, and so you can see I'm just popping up all of my sails at the moment to uh, speed up and overtake my friendly constitution so that I can continue hammering the enemy surprise which is behind. And you can see the enemy constitution is now maneuvering to come into line with the enemy surprise, and we're going to have a two two broadsides two broadsides versus two broadsides engagement soon, which is. Uh, 
which is going to even the odds, but the amount of hammering we've done to the surprise should mean that we have the advantage and that uh, the enemy surprise will sink sooner than me, than I will, my surprise. Um, it's very interesting, this is actually the first time that I've had such an equal uh, PvP engagement in this game, and it's it's nice just to, that I recorded it for the video here, because it shows you, it shows you more tactically what you should be thinking about because when you've got just a jumble of loads of different kinds of ship it's kind of it's kind of hard to see tactics at work because everyone has their own different ideas and and uh, it kind of it's a bit like a world of tanks public game you know um, and you can see he my friendly constitution is giving me headings to, to sail um, so we're still we're st we've still got that communication running it's still working very well um, you can see me using my sails there to maneuver as quickly as I possibly can to bring my port broadside back onto the enemy surprise, who pretty much has no armor anymore. Um, and you can see that he's, he's starting to founder now, he's starting to, to, to go down. And I think this is probably the last broadside I give him, and then he sinks. Uh, and then that just leaves us both. So, I say bad volley. But he's still going down. So there we go. The enemy surprise has now just been sunk. And it's now just me and the the enemy constitution. Uh, with my friendly constitution, sorry. So now I'm saying in the chat, what's the plan? He's done. You know, what? What are our t what's our tactical plan to take out the constitution now? We've got 2v1. Uh, and he's now telling me his rudder is down. And he's repairing it. Um, and I think I think his his magazine was hit as well at some point. So he he did come under a lot of fire. He took the brunt of the fire in this engagement. I I to be honest, I got off really easy in this engagement because I was the his supporting ship. Uh, I did not get much of of the action uh, per se. See the di the difference the difference in this engagement is that we both went we both focused on the enemy surprise and they both focused on the enemy our friendly constitution. So as a result, our friendly constitution has been chewed up quite a lot, but the enemy surprise is completely gone, and that is the trade off that we that we made. That at the end of the game, at the end of that initial conflict, we both have two ships left, and he only has one, which means that we come out on top. So, I think, I think that worked to our advantage. And if I was to do that again, I would still do the same thing. It's about how many ships you have, <coughs> how many guns you have, and how many you can bring to bear at any given time. And if you have more guns than your enemy, then you have the advantage. So you need to continue to push that advantage um, and make it a victory so I'm just telling him I'm moving in front of him because I'm, I've, I'm back in that same situation where he is my friendly is in between my enemy so he's just said 10 which means he's turning to 10 degrees um, so now I can open up on the on the constitution broadside putting in some shots there And so now we're in a good position. He is actually, um, he wants, th this This is actually an interesting point of the game because this is where we both go our separate ways for a second. Um, all this time we have been maneuvering together. We have been moving as one, which has, uh, has really helped us a lot against uh, the adversary who both, they both split up and they paid the price. Uh, but we did not split up at any time until now. And this is where you see, it looks like I'm going to pass his left-hand side, and it looks like our friendly constitution is going to pass to his right-hand side. And he actually says in the chat just about now, he says, no, because he can see what's going to happen. We And, and we don't want to get on e both sides of the enemy constitution, because that means that he can fight both broadsides and even the odds. We don't want that to happen. And he, I think he says it just about now. But what I was doing was I just shot off my starboard broadside and now I'm maneuvering as quickly as I can to bring my port broadside back to bear because I wanted in that small space of time to fight both, both broadsides and maneuver so that he could only bring his one broadside to bear. So it's just maximizing the guns that we have 
uh, to the targets that we, we need to take out. And as you can see, I think at this point he does maneuver enough to get some shots in. But at this point we have an ad enough of an advantage that we can be a bit gutsy about about how we how we play this. He's he's tacking and I'm coming across. I'm yeah, he, yeah, he he puts some shots into me here. This is pretty much the first serious uh shot that I get in the game. I'm very lucky in this game that I didn't get chewed up more. But here we go. And I make sure that I shoot clean and true and that none of my shots actually miss the enemy and go and hit my friendly constitution on the other side. Now this is uh, now this is an interesting point because at this point, you know, he, he's kind of locked. The enemy constitution is locked in the wind. He doesn't know how, where to maneuver. We're both circling him steadily, or I'm circling him steadily. Our, our friendly constitution is stern camping him. And I'm just kind of willy-nilly. I'm just a bit like... I, I'm going a bit YOLO at the moment. That, that was my, my problem at the end. And you can see that on going going around the enemy ship, I got both his broadsides in in my one side of my ship. And I think I just popped a repair kit there, I can't remember. But... So we're just steadily wearing him down. I'm just gaining some speed. And then make the maneuver. And if at this point, folks, you don't know how to properly use your sails to do sharp, quick maneuvers, um, I'm sure there are videos on the internet uh, so far at the moment uh, detailing. I think RamJB has some very good stuff on how to properly maneuver. Um, but it's just using physics and common sense and uh, what angle is the wind to your sail and what effect is that happening on the, having on your ship, really. That's, that's, that's basically the way you should be thinking. <clears throat> so at this point we're now in the ideal position where we are both on the same side of him so we're able to put two broadsides into his one and I think at the moment I do something yeah I'm, I'm just kind of yellowing around I'm yeah I'm maneuvering to bring my opposite broadside yeah, it's, you can you can see my my uh, port armor is is down at half strength. So I was probably at this point bringing my starboard armor, which is relatively untouched, uh, to bear, and then do uh, an anti to to do a clockwise rotation around the enemy ship. And of course, our friendly constitution, knowing I mean a constitution isn't terribly maneuverable. I I at the moment. In my in unlocking ships, I have unlocked the Constitution, and I've been uh, using the Constitution for a while. And it's just refreshing to get back into something a bit smaller, like the Surprise, where it's still a frigate. It can still, you know, pack a punch, but it is more maneuverable than something like the Constitution. Uh, I'll be covering the Constitution in a later video, but uh, the Constitution is basically a heavy frigate. It's 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 a proper. Uh, it's a it's a frigate as frigates were meant to be, really. I think. Um, uh, the classic frigate of the high high points of the Age of Sail was basically a seventy four gun ship. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head if the Constitution is a seventy four gun ship. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but if the constitution does represent that that high point in frigate construction um, and the HMS surprise by the way is a frigate as well but it's a frigate of the of the late 1700s by the early 1800s by the battle of 1812 and just and beyond there that is the age of the constitution that is the age of the heavy 74 gun frigate and um, in in nation in national uh, in maritime powers, uh, you generally saw a lot more 
uh, frigates and 74s and smaller ships like like the, the surprise here in the Constitution than the massive ships of the line. You, you didn't see as many HMS Victories or Santismas. They were they were your blockade ships or the, or they were your ships only to bring out on a massive fleet engagement that would that would turn the tide of a war. You know, you you never took your your first rates out in to do commerce raiding or anything. That was the job of the frigates and the corvettes and the sloops and those kinds of ships. So if if you want to look at it realistically, these were the 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 apex. The, these were the, the alpha predators of, of the open seas, these frigates, because they had maneuverability and they could pack a punch. Obviously not as, as much of a punch as the first rates, but they were smaller, faster, more maneuverable, uh, they were cheaper to make, of course, than, than a first rate, less less timber and sail and yacht and cordage. Um, and they were just kind of the all round, it's almost like a medium tank in World of Tanks. It's an all round tank, it was an all round ship that can perform. And if you get one of these ships in, in a particular part of the ocean and it does well at commerce raiding, it could tip. It could tip the, the balance of power, uh, the the econo economical power of a nation uh, easily. If it if left unchecked, a ship like this or a ship like the Constitution could have easily have done that back in those days. Okay, so we're just finishing up the game, and uh, yep, that's the end of the game. So thank you very much for watching, folks, and uh, I will catch you in another video.